ancient warriors, prophets, kings, politics, conspiracies. No, this is just thousands of years of truth and history. It's the word of God. And I'm Wade. And I'm Jen. And join us as we add oil to our lamps, learning from and applying the Holy Scripture to our lives. As we go, as we set out in a dark world and uncover the things that want to remain hidden by shining the light of Christ. Awake, O sleeper. This is out of the darkness. First Samuel chapter 22 So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all of his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble, or in debt, or who were just discontented, until David was the captain of about 400 men. Later, David went to Mizpeh in Moab, where he asked the king, Please, allow my father and mother to live here until I know what God is going to do for me. So David's parents stayed in Moab with the king during the entire time David was living in a stronghold. One day the prophet Gad told David, Leave the stronghold and return to the land of Judah. So David went to the forest of Hareth. The news of his arrival in Judah soon reached Saul. At the time, the king was sitting beneath the tamarisk tree on the hill of Gabia, holding his spear and surrounded by his officers. Listen here, you men of Benjamin, Saul shouted to his officers when he heard the news. Has that son of Jesse promised every one of you fields and vineyards? Has he promised to make you all generals and captains in his army? Is that why you've conspired against me? But not one of you told me when my own son made a solemn pact with the son of Jesse. You're not even sorry for me. Think of it, my own son encouraging him to kill me as he is trying to do this very day. Then Doeg, the Edomite, who was standing there with Saul's men, spoke up. When I was at Nob, he said, I saw the son of Jesse talking to the priest, Ahimelech, son of Ahitub. Ahimelech consulted the Lord for him. Then he gave him food and the sword of Goliath the Philistine. King Saul immediately sent for Ahimelech and all his family, who served as priests at Nob. When they arrived, Saul shouted at him, Listen to me, you son of Ahitub. What is it, my king? Ahimelech asked. Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me? Saul demanded, Why did you give him food and a sword? Why have you consulted God for him? Why have you encouraged him to kill me as he is trying to do this very day? But sir, Ahimelech replied, Is anyone among all your servants as faithful as David, your son-in-law? Why, he is the captain of your bodyguard and a highly honored member of your household. This was certainly not the first time I had consulted God for him. May the king not accuse me and my family in this matter, for I knew nothing at all of any plot against you. Surely you will die, Ahimelech, along with your entire family, the king shouted, and he ordered his bodyguards, Kill these priests of the Lord, for they are allies and conspirators with David. They knew he was running away from me, but they didn't tell me. 
But Saul's men refused to kill the Lord's priests. Then the king said to Doeg, You do it! So Doeg the Edomite turned on them and killed them that day, eighty-five priests in all, still wearing their priestly garments. Then he went to Nob, the town of the priests, and killed the priests' families, men and women, children and babies, and all the cattle, donkeys, sheep, and goats. Only Abiathar, one of the sons of Ahimelech, escaped and fled to David. And when he told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord, David exclaimed, I knew it when I saw Doeg the Edomite there that day. I knew he was sure to tell Saul, now I have caused the death of all your family. Stay here with me and don't be afraid. I will protect you with my own life, for the same person wants to kill us both. Well, a lot happened in that chapter. Yeah, there was a lot going on, wasn't there? Yeah, we see this is where we're going to start reading the end of Saul. And Saul is a fascinating historical figure to me because not only does he illustrate the, again, he's like the outward manifestation of the internal spiritual condition of the people of Israel at that time. Also, in so many ways, he's a cautionary tale of how a lot of us can, I guess, end up on our walks. Mm. He started out all right. He's chosen. But what was evident was he had a lack of spiritual insight, spiritual knowledge. And, and that never grew. The depth wasn't there. So the spiritual growth never happened. And like the road to hell being paid with good intentions, he had a lot of good intentions for the decisions he made. But ultimately, those decisions were made without God. He disobeyed God and ultimately chose not to follow God and ultimately chose to fight against God. Saul wasn't willing to submit. And so many of us in our life paths, we forget the humility and we forget the submission. And we have good intentions for the things we want to do. We get our sights set on something. We get our decisions made and our minds are made up, failing to acknowledge the one who is supposed to be the Lord of our life. So many times people, especially in the Christian world, have an idea of what they want to do for ministry, have an idea of where they want to go, have their hearts set on something, but never inquired of God about any of it. And that's the first and foremost. And that's one of the things that ultimately was the stumbling block for Saul and also a reflection on the people. We're going to see the counter of that with David here. And David, in the last chapter, he was in a panic. He was doing things uncharacteristically. 
that caused me to postulate that these things were done out of possibly fear, is irrational behavior stemming from fear, and having to be reminded even by the enemy of all the amazing things God has done in his life. It's easy, especially for us as believers today, for, to forget about the things that God has brought us through, the things that he's brought us out of when we're in a mind of fear. Things just shut down. We're not in our right mind anymore. The beginning of chapter 22 here, coming out of the Philistines, he's going to the cave of Adullam. Adullam is back into the territory of Israel. It's on the outskirts, but it's, it, but it's back in. So David's coming back little by little back to his his call he's still hiding out he's out in the cave and all his uh, brothers and his father's household they're joining him in there and possibly Saul's rage his fury his desire to kill David that's extended to his family because see Saul is completely hell-bent on destroying David because Saul is is so concerned about his legacy. He's so concerned about who's going to sit on that throne, quote unquote. I mean, there's no physical throne. But who's going to have that title when he's gone? He wants his line to inherit that role, that title. And we've talked about this before. The warring ideologies here, uh, spirit and flesh, Saul, again, working in the flesh, concerned with the flesh, concerned with only the tangible, what he can see, touch, taste, and smell. God, on the other hand, forming this kingdom, originally supposed to be some theocratic idea ran by a spiritual entity, ran by God. Yet the people, they looked around, they saw the surrounding nations, thought, we need an actual king, an actual person. So God relented, gave them over. Okay, you can have a king. But see, now the way God is running things is he looks on the heart. He looks inward. When the people looked outward, God looks inward. When we automatically assume the next in line is the son, the heir, the oldest, it may not be what God's ideas are. Saul representing that fleshly part of us, warring against the spirit. Having the inability to submit our ambitions, our goals, our desires, our dreams, what do those stem from? We read and we know that Saul's stems from selfishness and disobeying. So we go back here to the beginning of 22 and everyone's joining David in, in, in this cave here on the outskirts of Israel. His family's going to him. This is everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became a commander, a commander to about 400 people, 400 outcasts. And you imagine David being a little reluctant. But even in that, there I see a lot of foreshadowing. These people allying themselves with David, these people allying themselves with the Spirit, these people who have diverse backgrounds. Yeah, there's people who are not content with Saul's leadership, but these outcasts, some of them, some of them kind of would remind me of the people that would probably hang around Jesus. David, wanting to protect his immediate family, goes to to Moab, Mizpah of Moab, and he asks the king there, let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. If we know, maybe some, maybe some don't know. Why is David going to Moab? Why is he going to the king of Moab? Why is he letting us, asking the king of Moab for his mother and father to stay there? Well, David's like, what, a quarter Moabite? He's a descendant of Ruth. Word's gotten out that, that David and Saul, they're not on great terms. King of Moab also, he's an enemy of Saul. Back in chapter 14, says, when Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the Ammonites, against Edom, against Soba, Philistines. And uh, Mizpah has something to do with stronghold, watchtower. And then the prophet Gad comes in, and he says, don't, 
nor remain in the stronghold, go to the land of Judah. And so God using Gad, he's calling David back, making him go deeper into his call. He was running away from it before, but God was calling him back. And we go into the verse 6, and the rest of the chapter deals with Saul and the continual downward spiral of his sanity, of his kingship. And so the word of David's whereabouts gets to Saul. And Saul's at Gibeah, and he's sitting under a tree. He's sitting there with a spear in his hand. He's sitting at Gibeah, Ramah, the spear emulating a royal scepter. And he addresses his men in a way that feeds on a nationalistic pride. He tells them the Benjamites. Hear ye Benjamites. So he's trying to appease the ones who are of the same tribe as him. He's grasping at whatever he can for some kind of connection with his men. And he's telling him, it's the son of Jesse. He doesn't address him as David, almost in a derogatory way. He's asking him, he's accusing his men. Did he promise he fields? Did he promise he vineyards? Did he promise to make you commanders that you've all conspired against me? See, in Saul's mind, it's just moving in the flesh, motivated by fear, paranoia, insanity. Bitterness. Bitterness, strife, envy. Not to mention, (laughs) you've got the uh, tormenting spirit from God that comes. All of this is clouding his mind, searing his conscience, and through paranoia, He's starting to accuse the people around him, accuse the people closest to him because he isn't able to see clearly. He's not a, He's not in his right mind. Similar to us, when we go into that state of being, we can't think clearly. We throw out accusations, unjust accusations. The accusations he throws out to his men are unjust. And there's no proof of what he's saying, but these are things that have been building up in his mind. Reminding me just of what Paul tells us and how we need to take every thought captive. When we give room for the enemy in our in our mind, and it just turns into the snowballing effect. But we can fall into this so easily. That's why Saul is such a fascinating person to study. He doesn't even put it past his own son. No one disclosed to me when my son makes a co- covenant with the son of Jesse. And he was sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my enemy against me? In effect, he's accusing his son of betrayal, which has no standing. Spoilers, guess what? Sadly, Jonathan's going to die fighting alongside his father by his side. So when his own men are standing all around him, not knowing what to say, seeing this person mulling under this tree... Then you have Doeg the Anamite coming out. We knew last chapter that was going to be some bad news bears there. We can see Doeg here. Maybe he's looking for an opportunity to get some social credit here. some Get some standing. He says, I saw son of Jesse come into Nob. To Ahimelech, son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him. Gave him provisions. Gave him the sword of Goliath. It just feeds into Saul's anger more. It's more fuel for that fire. Of course, Saul summons all the priests. The priests that were in Nob starts accusing them. And interesting, he addressed the priest, Ahimelech, the one who helped David out, in the same manner he talks of David. He calls David son of Jesse, calls Ahimelech here son of Ahitu. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't even notice that. Why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse. So, not using their names. And that you've given him bread, sword, you inquired a God for him. He's ri- so that he has risen against me. And Ahimelech here is trying to appeal to reason. Who among all your servants is so faithful as David? You know, basically, what has he done? Who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? today the first time I've inquired of God for him? No. That's a bit of a dig. 
It's a bit of a dick, because see, David inquired of the Lord quite a bit, contrasting that to Saul. He's saying, of course David would be over here around us. Of course David would be inquiring of the Lord for us, from us. It's what we should all be doing. And I wonder if that stung a little bit for Saul. Ahima looks like, I don't know of any of this conspiracy. And all Saul has to say is, surely, you will surely die, you and all your father's house. And Saul looking around and all of his, his guards around, tells him, kill the priests. And there's about 85 of them there. So I mean, all the priests that were in Nob tells his men, kill these priests of the Lord. It's almost like Saul asking the asking them to kill that last part of God, you know, that last part of spiritual reasoning, the last part of that still small voice crying out. It's almost like Saul's asking, kill that. And luckily the men standing around Saul had enough sense to know that's too nuts. They had enough sense to know, I don't think these guys are guilty of anything. That and who would want to mess with you know like the lord's priests you know what i mean like they saw how the lord helped them in battle so much and now saul is wanting them to kill the priests of the lord it shows the condition of the spirit and mind of saul when his own men standing around know what's better but we have bad news bears Doag's hanging around. And so he tells Doag, you do it. And he did. He turned and struck down the priest. He killed 85 persons who wore those priestly garments. And then he went to Nob. And he put everyone to the sword. Man, woman, child, infant, ox, donkey, sheep. He annihilated it. But Saul annihilated it using Doeg. And there's a couple of things going on here. One, this is a bit of a callback, kind of. A contrasting callback. Because earlier in Samuel, God gave the same orders to Saul for the Ammonites. And he didn't do it. He kept what he thought was good for himself. So that was one where he disobeyed God. But interestingly, what he was supposed to do to the Ammonites, he did to the city of Nob and the priests of the Lord. He put to the sword or he devoted to destruction. It's the same language that God used with him for the Ammonites. So he had the capability of carrying out the tasks that God wanted him to do. And now by this, he is literally the enemy of God. He's like a Satan. He's like an adversary. Now he's made himself an enemy of God. The text points out Doeg being an Edomite, I think in Isaiah or something. The Edomites are going to be sworn enemies of Israel. I think that's in Isaiah. Then there's a psalm, Psalm 52. It's about Doeg. Now why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast of God... The steadfast love of God endures all day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. The other thing that's happening here, if we go further back into Samuel, so Ahimelech, he's in relation to Eli. Eli, remember, he had the two sons, Phineas and Hophni, and they were corrupt. Right, okay. Eli never addressed the issue with the corrupt sons, and it was foretold to him by Samuel. Any of your heirs, or any of your relation, they're going to come to a violent end. And that's what ends up happening with Ahimelech and the priest there, and the priest did not. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know that he was related. Mm. So that's like more of prophecy being fulfilled. And some go back and forth thinking, um, well, God used Doag to fulfill that prophecy. 
Um, and I don't see it like that, like God sending Doag to kill all the. Yeah. I don't. I. I don't see it like that. But I basically see it as since. I mean, God's just saying all 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 the males are gonna. They're gonna meet a terrible end. Or you know, because like, God is outside of time and He sees it. But yeah, there's a lot of things that link further back in Samuel. Mm. Uh, but one person escapes Abiathar, flees and goes after David. And he tells David what Saul did to the priests. And, and David's full of remorse because he's thinking back. He's thinking back to when he saw Doeg. He knew. He even says, he takes he even takes responsibility. And he tells him to stay with me. He's basically aligning himself with the priests and doing the opposite of what Saul has done. So it's a really interesting chapter. And it's the the chapter, I think, has cemented the searing of Saul's conscience, I think. This is just me thinking. He'll have times where he's reluctant or remorseful, but his actions don't seem to prove any authenticity in those behaviors. There'll be several times where David has the chance to take Saul out and David doesn't do it out of respect. And now that God at one point anointed this guy, David lets him go each time. Saul is remorseful each time, apologetic each time, but then his actions don't seem to go with his words. So we're seeing the downward spiral and the fall of one chosen by God. Contrasting that to David being chosen by God. And through hardships, through pain, through suffering, through fear, through making mistakes, we're going to see an ascension. But yeah, David tells Abiathar, stay with me, do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safe keeping and i think as we read through this chapter and then the chapters to come i hope that everyone takes that last sentence in and with me you shall be in safekeeping in god and jesus we are in safekeeping you know we don't have the the hopes that we have in the flesh and the comfort of the flesh oh it's nice to have a roof over your head it's nice to be able to shower and eat when you want it's nice to have the place to lay your head and rest we also know and are reminded that our destinies are for a heavenly kingdom a spiritual kingdom and our leadership is from the spirit and in our lives i hope that we can continue to submit to our heavenly father and submit to the spiritual words that spiritual leadership that spiritual direction in each of our lives as we continue to walk down that path that God has laid out before each of us. There might be some stones in the way. There might be some potholes. There might be some briars. But the path is still there and all we do is walk it. And so, until the next time, this has been Wade. And I'm Jen. And this was an Out of the Darkness Ministry Podcast. Grace and peace.